All right, guys, chapter 31, uh, the fair deal in containment, you know, basically post-war uh, United States here following World War II. I'm going to try to get through this pretty quick. Uh, I know you guys didn't really enjoy the 45-minute lecture last time, so I'll try to do this as fast as I can. Uh, make sure to go check the student notes for this in the on the website. Uh, I really recommend you f fill those out as you listen to the lecture and read the chapter. Also, make sure to watch the videos I put in there. Uh, at the moment, there's only one, but I'll put a couple more in later, uh, and it's the President's uh, bio for Harry Truman. It's a good one. All right. Truman's an easy start. You know, uh, as you remember in the last chapter, Harry Truman gets called in the middle of the night shortly after uh, FDR's election to his fourth term. <clears throat> he was a simple, sort of straightforward guy from Missouri. Um, you no know, college experience, uh, you know, your textbook talks about how he invokes, you know, Andrew Jackson's sort of common man kind of feeling. Um, he comes in, and one of the things he does is he replaces FDR's sort of cabinet with uh, guys that are sort of loyal to him and ha share his same mindset. Uh, his big deal is he expand. He, he looks to expand a lot of the uh, New Deal stuff that Truman had passed, not Truman, excuse me, FDR had passed, and, uh, you know, like stuff like uh, higher minimum wage, more public works, uh, even some civil rights stuff. Um, and you can read the rest of that in your textbook. But that's really what he, his, his goal is, is to extend that. All right. Uh, converting to peace, uh, there's a big push to bring home the troops. Remember, this is the largest mobilization the United States has ever looked at. And there's, you know, something like 12 million guys overseas. So in, by 1947, the army has sh shrunk to 1.5 million and then by 1950, it's only 600,000. Um, a lot of people were worried about how the economy was going to adjust with bringing these troops home. A lot of people thought, uh, you know, you had to kind of find jobs for them. That was now, they were now filled by women, so forth and so on. One of the important things that happened was the Service Readjustment Act, or more, more uh, commonly referred to as the GI Bill, uh, which is still something that's around today for uh, veterans returning home from, from serving. Uh, you know, it, it pays for education and uh, stuff along those lines. And uh, it kind of gives them a footing uh, of, you know, to get back to normalcy. Um, the fear was a little bit, not maybe not unfounded, but dealt with in a, in a pretty logical and reasonable way. Uh, there were controls to sort of ease us back into post, you know, ease us into post-war United States. While Europe kind of falls apart, we kind of kind of bloom, if you will. Um, one of the things is we control inflation because, you know, during the war there have been price controls and wage controls, and then following the war, a lot of these places now could charge more money, and so the prices for stuff went up, which meant higher profits, which meant labor unions wanted more money. And one of the interesting things, and one of the things I find very entertaining about Harry Truman, is uh, his how he deals with this, uh, you know, basically he threatens to, there's like a labor, labor strike for the railroad or something like that. And he threatens to draft all the strikers into the, uh, army. And eventually at some point there's going to be a, a strike over a, over steel mills trying to shut down and he needs the steel to fight the Korean war. And he threatens to send, to force them to be open and all this sort of stuff. And the Supreme court steps in and says he can't do that sort of overbounds his, uh, rights as the chief executive there. Uh, partisan conflict, um, you know, if you think about the last sort of election cycle or two, cy two cycles ago, I guess, uh, when, you know, the Republicans have been in power for so long and President Obama ran on his, you know, change, uh, hope and change kind of uh, platform, uh, that was kind of what the Republicans had going for them. Uh, the Democrats have been in office for so long and they had their had enough uh, question mark uh, ad going around, kind of reminiscent, I guess, of the Miss Me Now or Miss Me Much, whatever everything that billboard in Lubbock for the for George Bush. Um, but what happens is uh, this is actually going to bring in a Republican Congress, uh, Republican-controlled Congress, and one of the things they're going to push pretty quickly is the Taft-Hartley Act, which is basically like an anti-union act. Right, its big thing was going to curb union power ban the use of what they refer to as the closed shop, which meant non-union -worker, non workers were not allowed to be hired into places. Uh, now, it did have other stipulations, like 
the the company shop or all these different things. You'll read about it in your text, but basically, uh, it tried to to lessen some of that stuff. It's going to pass, but uh, Truman's going to veto it. And as I talk about the veto, take note of the picture of him here and, and where it says right here, the buck stops here. Truman was famous for that. You know, there's the phrase, pass the buck, um, meaning to the, the problem or whatever. And since he's the highest office in the land, the buck stops here means, you know, he has to deal with it kind of deal. Um, and in dealing with it, he vetoes it because he didn't see it as right. Um, also, this gave him a lot of cachet with the uh, labor unions. Now, it doesn't really matter that he vetoed it because the Republicans had a strong enough Congress to pass it anyway. And they do, and what happens is in the South, uh, 15 states, namely in the South, 15 states begin to pass states' rights, uh, working laws, with the idea of the Right to Work Act, or the Right to Work uh, mantra, meaning like no, less unions, basically, and people don't have to deal with unions as a business owner slash worker. And Texas today is still a right-to-work state. Uh, 1947, uh, they also passed the bipartisan majority, uh, oh, the, the bipartisan majority passes the National Military Establishment Act. And this is going to set up sort of infrastructure that had been set up during the war and makes it sort of standard and official. Okay, It creates the departments of the Navy, Army, Air Forces, uh, the two Joint Chiefs of Staff, which had been used during the war, became permanent fixtures for the president and parts of the National Security Council, which was now a permanent fixture, and also created the Central Intelligence Agency with the U.S.'s new role as a sort of world power and sort of, you know, protector of democracy. We needed uh, information on states around the world, and the CIA was going to provide that. All right, the Cold War. Now, the Cold War clearly extends past this chapter, but this is where it gets started. Uh, <clears throat> building the United Nations, all right, towards the end of the United, uh, excuse me, towards the end of World War II, FDR realized that the world was going to be broken up into spheres of influence by the, the powers in those areas. And even that was the case, uh, he wanted to, t to temper that and also to feed the U.S. people uh, what they wanted, the idea of having an uh, institution that would help ensure peace around the world. And with that, you get the ideas for the United Nations. So 50, uh, 50 countries or nations that were currently at war with the Axis powers met in San Francisco uh, and signed the UN Charter. Uh, the UN Charter would be made up of these 50 countries. Namely, the most important thing of this uh, was going to be the Security Council, which its whole goal was to maintain peace. It ends up kind of being a, a situation for squabbling amount, um, about stuff and blocking one another and all this sort of stuff, as you'll see as we talk about it through the rest of the, the, rest of the course. But um, initially it was 11 members. Uh, it's grown to as many as 15, uh, with 10 elected seats that rotate every two years, and five permanent members, uh, the United States, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, France, and China. The Security Council are the ones that really make the decisions about going to war and so forth. Um, and what's going to happen is, is you're going to see the Soviet Union and China versus the U.S., the U.K., and France, all right? And that's going to foreshadow our, our NATO stuff, which we'll see here in a few few slides, I think. Uh, differences with the Soviets. Uh, oh, actually, before I get to that, the unlike the League of Nations, uh, Woodrow Wilson's baby after World War One, the Senate approves uh, the... Charter for the United Nations, 89 to 2, so overwhelming approval for that. Uh, difference with the Soviets, uh, the United, excuse me, the USSR set up compliant governments, uh, basically pro-communist governments, governments that would be sympathetic to the communist cause, uh, instead of democ democratically held elections uh, like they promised to do at the Yalta Conference. So this is going to annoy uh, the Allies, and also it's going to bring animosity there because the Soviet Union is going to say, well, you're you know, negotiating a treaty with the Germans behind our back kind of thing. Um, this will set the stage for the falling of the Iron Curtain, all right? Uh, Winston Churchill, in a telegram, and I believe in a famous speech he gave, uh, says, uh, what, is, what is to happen in Europe? Uh, an Iron Curtain is drawn upon the Russian front. You know, we're not going to know what's going on behind it, that kind of thing. And the Iron Curtain, as you can see here, will be, you know, this line through Germany, down through Austria, around Hungary and Yugoslavia and all that. 
And everything east of it will be communist, and everything west of it, for the most part, will be either neutral or uh, capitalist or democratic or however you want to look at it. Um, and that sets the stage for the next, you know, 50 years, or 40 years, whatever it is. Um, and in doing so, in dealing with this, uh, Russia has, you know, as I said, setting up these governments is, is against what they said, um, at the, at the Yalta conference, and Truman will actually chew out their foreign minister, and the, the foreign minister says that no one ever to talk to him like this. Basically, Harry Truman says, well, we wouldn't have to talk to you like this if you just lived up to your agreements. Um, now, <clears throat> what's going to happen here is the very famous uh, concept of containment, all right? Much like, you know, in American history, we have stuff like, say, Manifest Destiny or, you know, the Monroe Doctrine or whatever. Well, containment and the Truman Doctrine are going to be the, the steps that the United States takes and the, and the dogma that they live by going into the 50s. And containment really came from George F. Kenan, Kenan I don't know how you say it, who was a counselor for, to the U.S. Embassy in Moscow. And he basically, in a report, wrote that the Soviets will try to fill every nook and cranny in the basin of world power. Okay, if you think about it, with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1989, uh, the the concept was it was kind of like a big pyramid scheme for them for it to really work. So they would need to spread it to more and more lands. What Keenan or Kenan, whatever it is, says is a long-term, patient but firm and vigilant containment of Russian expensive tendencies was needed. So wherever Russia went, we had to go and counteract them. Now, not go toe-to-toe -to, -toe to war with Russia, because that would institute, you know, nuclear war and that sort of stuff. But, uh, we do need to, uh, you know, be vigilant against them, alright? And so you'll see this all over the world. You'll see this in Korea, and Vietnam, uh, in Latin America, so forth and so on. Now, the first place you're going to see it is actually in Germany. Uh, or, I take that back. The first place you're going to see it is Turkey and Greece. Um, Turkey is going to get pressured by Russia to put uh, stuff down here in the on the Bosphorus, have uh, naval bases. Also, Greece will have to fight against communist the Communist Party slash revolution in Greece. And the UK had been trying to, to bolster them by providing aid and money, at which, at which point the, they said they can't do it anymore, so we had to take that over. Now, the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan, the Truman Doctrine is basically to contain communism, all right? Uh, $400 million is going to be spent on Greece and Turkey to fight communism. Truman says, I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting uh, attempted subjugation by armed minorities by out and by outside pressures. So, wherever in the world we're going to be there and we're going to spend money and, you know, infrastructure and provide infrastructure and training to stop this. Okay? Yet again a good example, Vietnam. We'll see this how we get involved with them in the 50s uh, and send eventually uh, oh, I forget the term, but aides and, you know, trainers and stuff like that and eventually our army ends up over there. Uh this is going to start the beginning of a contest of ideologies, okay? Democratic West versus the Communist East, uh, you know, Miracle on Ice, whatever, however you want to think about it. Uh, and so, that's going to be all over the world, okay? In the first place, we're really going to look at how these guys are going to come head-to-head -head with each other. We'll be in post-war Europe, all right? So, infrastructure has been destroyed in Europe due to the war, they had a harsh winter, there wasn't very much food, and it was ripe for some sort of fascist, communist uh, takeover in some of these places, because people had lost a lot of faith, much like after World War I, they had lost a little bit of faith in the Western ideal and democratic governments. So, in 1947, the, the then Secretary of State, George C. Marshall, comes up with this idea for the Marshall Plan, big important thing in, in American and world history here. He says they need to aid and rescue Europe from disaster and communist subversion. And how are we going to do that? By pumping money into those places and, and promoting economic recovery. All right. So if you look at Western Europe today, it can, uh, you know, it has a lot to thank old George C. Marshall for. All right. Um, they spent thirteen billion dollars from 1948 to 1951 propping up the Western European economy. To, to, to support jobs and infrastructure. 
Now, one of the places uh, that this comes into being will be Germany. So, what happens is, is following the war, you can see how uh, the Soviet Union swept down from right to left right here and controlled those areas in Eastern Europe, right? And we talked about how the United States withdrew because of the Yalta, plan uh, Yalta Conference and all that sort of stuff. And the places that were held by in the occupation zones, if you will, of Western European powers like France and the UK and us, uh, they became democratic, while the other places became communist, and the dividing line was in Germany. Now, uh, this is the Iron Curtain that, uh, uh, what do you call it, Churchill mentioned. Uh, one of the big problems, though, of it is that the German capital, Berlin, happens to be in eastern Germany. Now, in, let's see here, what did I write it down? Uh, in April 1948, the Soviet Union closes traffic into West Berlin because you have to go through East Berlin, East Germany to get there. So Truman decides very uh, measuredly that he will not ha send armed convoys to make sure they resupply the people in West Berlin. But what they do do is pretty, pretty impressive and pretty famous. Uh, it's called the Berlin Airdrop. All right? And so starting in April of 1948, around the clock to May 1949, Shipments are going to be flown into West Berlin to provide food and resupply of vital stuff like fuel and stuff along those lines. All right, And eventually, in May of 1949, thanks to treaties, they then reopen up West Berlin. But the Berlin airdrop was a very, very impressive uh, feat put on uh, by the world, really, not just the United States, to, to keep West Berlin... Uh, alive and going in a democratic nature. And so following this point, you now have the formation of two countries. You have West Germany here and East Germany here, all right? And they'll compete as two different countries in the World Cup and, uh, and uh, Olympics going forward from that point. Now, alliances doesn't seem to be showing up on your slide because the way it got formatted, but there's another section of alliances. Um, yet again, following this contest of ideologies that we mentioned, the two warring factions basically break up into two groups. You get NATO, which is going to be most of the Western European and the North Atlantic people forming the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, all right? If one country gets attacked, they all get attacked. Namely, it, it provided the United States places to put bases, because what's going to happen is Truman's going to see the Korean War as a ploy to then weaken up Western Europe, all right? So if we can have army bases over there, uh, we can then hold them off. And most people thought during the Cold War that the beginning of World War III would commence with a rapid deployment of tanks and bombers and stuff like that into Western Europe. Um, so the NATO pact will help sure that up. As a counter to this, there will be the creation of the Warsaw Pact, Warsaw Poland right there, which will be all the communist states. Another big thing during this time period in alliances is in 1947, the UN decides to partition up Palestine. Okay, Palestine, as we know, is the Holy Land, and, and now today part of where Israel is, and that's what they create. They create Israel. So they par partitioned Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. All right? um, some people see this as like uh, sympathy following the Holocaust. It was actually in the works years and years and years before the Holocaust. Um, FDR, having been in contact with Jewish leaders, uh, makes sure to quickly recognize the Jewish state of Israel, which is going to piss off the Arab states, and thus set off years and years and years of continuous and off and on again uh, war between Arab states and Israel in the area, and make difficult situation make a difficult situation for foreign politics for the United States and the Middle East, even up until to this day. All right, civil rights in the 40s. Uh, Truman is going to uh, really be progressive in this. He's going to look to create committees to end racial violence, uh, set up a sort of continual or permanent civil rights commission, and push for the desegregation of schools. Um, he's going to end racial discrimination when hiring federal employees, and, and most importantly, he's going to, or not maybe most importantly, but most impressively, he's going to end racial segregation in the military. So by the 1960s, we'll be the most integrated military in the world. Uh, the first big thing here is is Jackie Robinson right here. Um, the m new movie 42 came out this weekend, so hopefully you guys will go see that, and I gave you extra credit for it. 
Um, also, this interesting story about Jackie Robinson. Realize that baseball at this point is the U.S.'s most you know favorite important sport. Um, and so you have differing leagues at this point. You have a women's league, or at least during the war, you had the women's league. Uh, you had the Negro leagues, uh, which were mostly made up of black players. And you wanted people wanted not, not how do you put this? Not everybody wanted the integration of the sports, but some people saw it as an important step. All right. Also, people realized that African American players were very very good, and they needed to be in the highest league. And so, if you wanted to compete and you wanted to compete well. You wanted to go get these players. Now, Jackie Robinson was a very good player. He wasn't the best player, though. A lot of people thought Josh Gibson was actually a better Negro League player. But the problem was, is Jackie Robinson's temperament was much better. And he was maybe a smarter guy, I don't necessarily know. But uh, he uh, had the right m- makeup of character to deal with the problems of racism and all the pr- stuff that gets thrown in his face uh, during his career. And so really his, you know, his, uh, you know, he, he, he won people over by playing well on the field. Uh, he stirred up a lot of African-American support for the Dodgers and other teams that start to take on black players. And it really became a, you know, you couldn't compete if you didn't start to, to look at these types of players, uh, which if you're interested in this, and again, there's a book called Soccernomics and it deals with the integration of European soccer and how you could measure this through years of teams and not taking black players, but besides that, we'll move back to U.S. history here. Um, so Jackie Robinson comes in and integrates the league, and then in, ooh, I don't remember the year if it's, uh, let's, oh, I don't have it on here, but it is 50th anniversary, I think, uh, of him coming into the league. They actually retired the number 42, I believe, except for maybe with the Dodgers. And so if you had the number 42, um, you could wear it for the rest of your career, but after that, teams were not allowed to wear the number 42. Like I said, I said, like I said except for the Dodgers, because I know Matt Kemp wears 42 for the Dodgers. Um, so I don't remember who wore it for the Astros, but even in, if you go to Minute Maid today, it's up on the wall. It's a, it's a retired number. Now, shaping the fair deal, uh, under esti- what's going to happen is um, Truman is going to un- underestimate the South, uh, and in looking at how he's going to run his next election, uh, he is going to make moves that are going to alienate part of the East, but he's going to do it to gain farmers in the West and Midwest. And so he's going to push aid for farmers, and he's going to push uh, more civil rights for minorities, or namely African Americans. And that's going to cause problems when it comes to the southern portion of the United States. Remember, for the, up to this point, we had the solid South. They had always voted Democrat. Now, the election of 1948... Uh, Republicans, remember they had a majority at this point, spurn most of Truman's deals, much to their uh, chagrin. Truman's going to get them in the end. They also uh, nominate Thomas Dewey, the governor of New York, all right, to run for president. Now, what's going to happen is, is there's going to be a rift in the Democratic Party, all right, much like the growing rift in the current Republican Party. And uh, the Democrats are going to break three different ways, or break into three different groups. You're going to have the Democrats that report, support liberal, uh, excuse me, moderate liberalism under Truman. Uh, you're going to have the Dixiecrats, which are going to push for states' rights, namely not civil rights. That's their big thing. And they're going to nominate Strom Thurmond, who was president, or I mean a congressman forever, uh, from South Carolina. And then the other group, the far left group, is going to nim- uh, nominate Henry A. Wallace, who had been a vice president for FDR, and f- form a progressive Democratic wing. And these three groups are basically going to cause problems for everybody else except for Truman, because the Republicans couldn't make Truman look too radical on either side because there were Democratic part- groups that were more radical. So Truman's going to have his whistle-stop tour, even though it didn't look very good for him. Um, they would shout, give him hell, Harry, and Harry would respond with, uh, I didn't give him hell, I just told him the truth, and they thought it was hell, all right? And he's going to speak his mind and, and kind of be very bold in his campaign, while Dewey is going to be very quiet in his campaign, not hoping to uh, offend anyone and assume he was going to get elected. Well, it doesn't work out that way. Late in the night of the election, it looks like Dewey's going to win, so they print the famous newspaper here, uh, and in the end, Truman wins by like two million votes, and crushes everyone in the uh, Electoral College thanks to the splitting of the Democratic Party. And he saw it as a victory for his New Deal and uh, moderate liberalism. 
Now, all right, the Cold War heats up. Most of this we're going to talk about in class, but I will start with losing China. All right, what's going to happen is China is going to have a civil war going on until Japan invades, right? And so you had two groups. You had the democratic group led by Chiang Kai-shek, who was going to be supported by the United States, and then you had a communist group led by Mao Zedong that's going to be supported by the Soviet Union. And Czech had the early lead in this. Uh, he's going to drive Mao's people off, and there's the famous march and all this sort of stuff. It's not a world history class, so I'm not going to get into it. But what happens is they become corrupt, and there's all these issues. And eventually, thanks to Soviet support, Mao is going to rise up and drive the uh, democratic government of China onto the island of Taiwan. Now, uh, they call this losing China because China had been our ally during World War II, uh, and then the government of China, still in the, the democratic government of China today, still on the island of Taiwan, uh, is now going to be was going to be the I, how do you put it, recognized government of China by the United States up until like the 70s, and then eventually we recognize the communist government and trade and all that sort of stuff opens up. Stuff with Korea and the Red Scare I will cover in class. Uh, I will see you guys there.